Cool. Hey, everyone. Are you having a good time? Yeah. Okay. Anyone in the back? Any, you guys having a good time, too? Nobody? Okay, fuck you. That guy is. That guy's awesome. Cool. We're about to hear a lecture on uh, designing free hardware, right? So uh, this sounds like it's going to be a really cool talk. I'm looking forward to it. So uh, take it away, guys. Okay. Hi, everybody. Especially that guy back there, because he's awesome. Uh, my name is Mog. This is Tim. Hi. And uh, like he said, we're going to talk to you today about uh, designing free hardware or scratching your own itch with a soldering iron. <laughs> that happened today. <laughs> uh, so I thought I'd get the stupid questions, I mean, uh, the frequently asked questions out of the way. Uh, the first thing people always ask when I tell them about free hardware is, so you're giving me uh, some free stuff. And no, nothing is free <laughs> except freedom. <laughs> so it's, it means freeze in speech, not as in beer. Um, then the next question people often ask is, uh, so how is this different than anything else, any other electronics that you might have? And so you can break up electronics and really into a few separate categories. Um, the first one is what I refer to as closed hardware. And it's not exactly what you would think. Um, it's not like your toaster or something else, I would say. Closed hardware would be something like a DVD player that actively works against you and that you can't fast forward through previews because somebody somewhere hates you. <laughs> The region coding and, and everything else. Right. Other limitations that you cannot change on the device that you paid for with your own damn money and use however you want. And so this, this kind of stuff is, is exceptionally bad and rates a 0% freedom on my scale. Um, and then you have this kind of middle ground further up the chain um, with hackable hardware. And so, like, for example, uh, the first thing I really wrote source code for um, that wasn't on a computer was uh, my Dreamcast. Uh, early on, some hackers found a way to get around the, uh, when the system boots, it checks for a key to make sure that the games are signed by the distributors, and so that you can only run safe games approved by Sega. And very early on, people found that key, um, and overnight, everybody had started porting emulators to the machine and other things. And I was able to write uh, hello world code and push code over the network and, and do lots of fun things with it. And then um, it was just great. And it really became my device. I was able to do anything I could want with it and things that the manufacturer had never had intended for. I went through a similar thing uh, playing with the PSP when I picked that console up. I thought this was really great hardware and a great package, but I couldn't do anything with it without cracking it open and, and, and hacking it. And I got to a point where I could run Linux and I could run my own code on it, and that's kind of where I wanted to be with it. And so. and so with these kind of things, you can get about halfway there. I would, on the free scale, the, the freedom dimension, it's, it's around 50%, and, uh, which is good for a lot of things. Uh, but we're not all the way there yet. So the next thing up on the list actually is what, what most people have been talking about this weekend at the convention is open source hardware. And so open source hardware is hardware, electronics, just like anything else, but it is licensed to you under a copyleft license so that you are free to modify the hardware, the schematics for the hardware are available, often the Gerbers are available, everything you would need to reproduce the device yourself is there and you can make improvements and share them with the community. Everything is really there. And there are a lot of great examples of this. Uh, for example, the TV Be Gone, uh, Mitch is here this week and uh, I think he even gave a lightning talk about it uh, yes. earlier. And they're really great. They cover just about everything, and so it rates really high on the, the freedom dimension at 90%. 90. So that's an A for effort. <laughs> uh, but you ask, why doesn't it get all the way? What, what makes it different than what I would call free hardware? And the distinction is that most of the projects that are called open source hardware are currently being built with proprietary software. Um, a very popular option is Eagle, which comes in a freemium edition, which allows you to build uh, four by three circuit boards um, with two layers and so many routes, so many other limitations. But you can do a lot in that little sandbox. And, and because of that, 
so many people have just not cared because they can design their little circuit board. And, and by little, I mean they're great projects. Like the Arduino is an example of something built using Eagle and has taken the world by storm. But if you wanted to modify it, you're going to have to use this proprietary program on your machine. And so what makes free hardware different is free hardware is built from the ground up using free software or open source software. So there is a great example of this in, in the RepRap project. The RepRap project is built using JITA, which is a uh, free software program that uh, allows you to design circuit boards from scratch. And so it, and I, I guess it really fits with the whole RepRap spirit in that you, you build the printer from scratch and you can replicate. And then you can go in and make changes with the software, all staying in the, inside the freedom dimension. And so free software merits on the freedom scale actually just a 95. It's just a little bit better. It's not 100%. And the problem with free hardware um, is that really in all electronics, everything is still a black box. And so to get to what I would call freedom plus plus, uh, you would have to have gone to the talk yesterday <laughs> where he talked about printing um, your own circuit boards. Uh, not your own circuit boards, your own uh, transistors. Uh, he gave a talk on, uh, what was it, this uh, organic carbon uh, yes. transistors, uh, which are, are free because right now the majority of all electronics uh, are built, uh, here let's go back, uh, wrong way, preview. So the RepRap, even though everything on it is free, the schematics, you can get data sheets that give you in-depth information on all the parts. So you really would have all the information to, to to do it, but the at mega is a black box. The motor controllers are black boxes. Every, everything on is a collection of black boxes that have great documentation about how to use them, but they are ultimately black boxes. And so it's just always moving into a, you know, a further curve to get down to 100% free. And so I would say right now, people have the option to hit 95 pretty easily. And, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, is, is using free software to develop your free hardware. And so then after I've gone through this whole spiel, people say, who cares? This is stupid. Why? <laughs> You're a free tard. Eagle's easy. <laughs> Eagle's easy. And so my first answer is I go Stallman on them. You know, <laughs> freedom is important. You got you to gotta fight for your rights. And then I go, no, I really don't care. Eagle works. And so I go, okay. <laughs> You're right, Eagle's easy, but there are problems. So there is two famous examples in the free software community where this has really bitten people, um, Java and BitKeeper. Um, the Java people, um, I'm sure you guys have been following the news, Oracle has sued Google for implementing Java, which they gave to the world. <laughs> And that's so stupid. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. And, and all these people were building stuff on Java even though it really wasn't fully open. And people just didn't care because why, why does it matter? They anticipated that they were getting something free. Right. Because it was free as in beer, not speech. And that was the problem. And then a very similar problem with BitKeeper. BitKeeper was a di distributed version control system. It predates Git. And it was used by the Linux kernel to maintain everything. And it was given to them for free by the company because they wanted to be a nice company. But then one day, somebody started reverse engineering it, who was a Linux kernel hacker. And they said, nope, take our ball, go home. And so Linux was left in, in the dark without anything. And so if you don't own it, building your, your infrastructure on top of something is very dangerous. And so people should be aware of that. And that's one point, I would say. and then. The next one is with the free software, um, what free software gives you an advantage in is that really the tools can be a lot more creative to fill certain niches. Uh, Eagle is great in that it's, it does everything in, in a very straightforward steps, but it doesn't have all the crazy features that a lot of the free software tools have. And um, we'll get more into that in a little bit here. And then, and then finally, there are limitations. Even though it's free as in beer, like I said before, there's the, the four by three um, right. 
four inches squared, you're allowed to make your boards, you're only allowed two layers, you're only allowed so many traces. Uh, the vias are actually octagons. There's lots of weird <laughs> issues with, with their software and, and it's all on their terms. It's just whenever they want to give you a new limitation or change, for example, uh, Eagle just changed all their formats um, for their file formats and so everybody is having to upgrade their symbols over time to, to be compatible and that doesn't really happen as often in free software because there's no reason we want to push people to use a new version of the software other than it's better. Um, and so really that's, that's why you should be free. And now that you've decided to be free, and I'm happy you've all decided to be free, uh, there's lots of options. Uh, a really easy place to start uh, if you play with Arduinos is a project called Fritzing. It uh, allows you to easily rig up and uh, pre-build your, uh, what you want to build with your Arduino. It allows you to breadboard up uh, schematics and see that they're going to work. It has a nice uh, user interface that shows off like LEDs, resistors, potentiometers. It allows you to just easily build projects and, it's all very and document visual. them. Very visual. Yeah. But it won't allow you to go, um, it makes it more difficult to do more complicated things in it. But it's a great thing to start with. And it's multi-platform, runs on Mac and uh, GNU Linux. Uh, the next option actually um, I'd like to talk about is, is one called KiCad. It's a Qt-based uh, uh, EDA, and it's very popular, I would say. Uh, it's probably more similar to Eagle, if people here want to you know, have a smoother transition. Uh, it's an all-in-one kind of setup. Uh, your schematics are directly linked to your, uh, your footprints, and everything kind of ties together. And it even has really cool 3D output. Uh, but I wouldn't recommend it because I don't like QT. <laughs> uh, it's an option, though. It's an option. And, and, my, and another option is this project called FreePCB. Uh, I've never used it before because it only runs on Windows. It looks pretty, though. <laughs> I don't know anything more about it. It, it is free. Windows is not oh, Windows is not free, not right. Free. And that's why I know nothing about it. Uh, supposedly, but... Uh, there hasn't been an update on the wine project about it in like six months, so I didn't really get that far. Um, there's another one written in top of Java, and so it works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, it has some very cool simulation stuff if you want to do kind of spice things. It can simulate your circuit and show how things work, and it also has EDA tools. Um, it, it's, it's a nice tool if you're big into Java, I would say. And then finally, we have the best tool. One we use. The one we use. <laughs> and that's why it's, not why it's the best, but it's why we use it. Uh, and it's called GEDA. It stands for GPL Electronic, uh, I forgot what D means this time. Design. Design. Automation. Automation. Yeah. Uh, and it's pronounced GEDA or JEDA. Yeah. JEDA. Mostly depending on which side of the pond you come from, it sounds like. Right. Uh, British people tend to say JEDA. Uh, here it is. This is the schematics editor. Uh, this is a schematic we've built. Uh, it allows you to, e just like all other schematic editors, pretty standard. Uh, here's the PCB footprint editor and uh, layout. And here is a Gerber view of a uh, partially finished project here. And so the advantages of JITA are that it's, uh, it's built in the Unix style philosophy and that it's, uh, so each Part of JITA is a separate program that you can chain together um, to, to do your project. And so it's several different programs, uh, and you run them all in, in sequence, and you get your build. And so it makes it really easy to, to have a make file that says, you know, take the schematic, get the net list, take it into the layout program, get the layout, get the Gerbers, send it off to the factory. And so that's really nice. Um, and like I was saying, so it's easy to segment the workflow. So in particular, in most of our projects, I will do a lot of the work on building the schematic and figuring out what parts we need to use and whatnot. And then I will, while I'm still working, I will say, Tim, we're going to use these parts, right. start building footprints for them, and start thinking about the layout of the, the board while I, I spend all my time doing this so we can really uh, get a whole ma uh, man month in, in less and time. As soon as he's done with that, he can send 
those files to me that I can then actually nail down the PCB design as it's finished. Right, and he only really needs to look at the output of what I've done generally right. uh, because it's all he needs. And so it, it really is good if you're working with a team um, especially because it allows you to break up the work. Um, one of the other advantages I would say of it is uh, the file format for all of the different parts of JITA are ju just text files. Uh, and so you, one of the nice things is you can change them outside of the GUI. You can go in, just open the text file on a text editor, change a comment. You can add comments. You can, you can just move things around easily in there. There are use cases where it's almost easier to do it that way than... Right. There, there's things like uh, we worked on one project and we wanted to resize all the through holes so that they had the same drill, drill yeah. size. You and so we didn't have replace. different drills. Yeah. Right. And so we did a search and replace and all the drill holes were the same size. I'm sorry? Can you do simulation? With JITA? Do what? Simulation. Simulation? Yes, there's SPICE tools in JITA. Um, I'm about to get to that. Uh, so because it's all text files, it's version control friendly. The diffs you get when you do a commit of a project into the system it actually is just a diff. It's very straightforward. Um, and one of the other nice things is there are actually several scripts people have written for JITA that will build standard footprints for you very easily. So you can say it's a TQFP with this kind of pitch and it's 32 pins and then it goes pop and you got you got that footprint and you're done um and there are lots of other uh generators that can do that kind of stuff uh file formats uh there's been some work between uh kcad kicad and uh jita to try to standardize between the two of them to have an interchange but that hasn't really taken off yet and there has been re some recent work now that uh, Eagle has switched their file format to an XML format. Um, people are currently trying, um, there's actually a lot more work in the KiCad community to port that. And then I imagine once that's done, JITA can just take that code and then import Eagle XML blobs. Uh, there are some file formats that are very interchangeable that JITA can work with. Uh, the standard uh, Gerber format, the RS247, yeah. I can't remember the exact name. Uh, is it? Its viewers can open those files very easily, and uh, there's some other f uh, formats that different things can open each other up. Uh, one thing that's nice about JIT, it's, it's actually a very old project. Uh, it's started in 1998. Uh, it was its first public release, and uh, it's it doesn't have lots of new features. Uh, the, the most crazy new feature that I've, I know of that has happened fairly recently was they added support for there's a, uh, a preview format so that you can see what your PCB will look like and they added in making it show the, the solder mask in different colors. And that was a big update. <laughs> so there's not, it's not dead, it's just everything you really need is done. Uh, there are some pretty features that people are still kind of working on like 3D OpenGL output so you can look what it's going to like physically fit in but that you don't really need that it just is pretty um and and in turn with this depth so the jita actually like i was saying is several different programs so there's spice wave analysis verilog simulator electromagnetic structural analysis uh there's garb reviewing there's there's just tons of different small programs in this whole suite of tools and so you really can do just about anything with it in hardware and the the community um, mailing list and the IRC channel uh, where people hang out with uh, have they've done a lot of this stuff so they can help you out and in, in using these tools and, and getting what you need done uh, seeing some very mature projects come out of you know very professional projects come out of this not just hobbyists yeah. right um, and so uh, so now you've decided to use Jita it's awesome. You gotta go where to go where, from here. Where do you start? Do you want to keep moving the slides though? Yeah, I'll move them for okay. you. So, so first step is having an idea, um, and that's kind of you, you're gonna have something you want to build, some project, some problem you want to solve, um, whether it's uh, something that's going to uh, spy on a spy bus for you uh, for for your own uh, learning for your own projects, or whether you want to. Uh, in the have an end product that does something um, or in in one of our cases a, uh, a a learning kit you know there these are things that you could do out of this so you have some idea and I, I really find it's great to look at you know don't don't worry about reinventing the wheel 
if you if you don't if you're not the electronics uh, guru, you know you can look at what other people are doing. Take the time to learn those things first. Um, you know if if you don't know how a resistor works, there's only so much these kinds of programs can help you with. You know, you've right. so but but you can go to other people. You can build small teams. You can work together with stuff, um, and you start to build a prototype. You find something that actually works um, when you put it on a breadboard. Um, stick little wires in, get something that's going to work. And, and so now you've, you've built this prototype, you've got this thing that works, it kind of, it blinks the way you want it to, or it does the thing you want it to do. You, you've done this uh, it really hands-on kind of prototyping, is a great way to start. Um, and this is something that uh, Fritzing as well, I'll go back to, this is sort of their level where they started at least. Um, right, that you can do all that. that you can do all that in their in software. In theory, in kind software. Of, yeah. um, right. And then you uh, once you've got that working though you're gonna build a schematic um, and that's going to to uh, tell you exactly where the where the connections are made what's actually going on what components you're using um, I've I've I do understand all this but I've left a lot of that work to to Mog so he feels like he's doing something <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, the really important things about the schematic is uh, so every step in hardware every time you fail a, a, a causing a, a time, in the mean times between failures can be weeks. Yeah. And uh, at least for me, I come from software, I'm much more happy with minutes. I like things to fail early and often, and then I can move on and fix them. And so what the schematics I find are most helpful for is, is making sure that you've dotted all your T's and crossed all your I's so that everything is correct. <laughs> right. If you're waiting till the, the PCB design stage to that, for that kind of troubleshooting, you're gonna have nothing but headaches because then you've gotta move whole components around and reroute traces. Right, and so, and so when you do the schematic, you go through every data sheet, check all the specs, yeah. make sure everything is within spec, and then um, once you've completed this, uh, the next step is you're just gonna go into PCB. Then you're, right, then you're going to actually create a physical path for everything. Um, everything has to have a layout. Everything. Right, but the nice thing is the step between schematic and PCB uh, is th there's a script in Jita that yeah, that's takes what we use. takes your um, your schematic and builds you a, a very good net list that shows you all where all the connections should be um, and and how they should be. You can mark traces being power traces or signal traces, and so then someone like yeah, Tim can and go and route. The, and it's almost, I will say as a hobby, it's almost fun that, that you can sit there and you work with a net list and you see all the connections in PCB that you're supposed to make and they're just logical. And then you start filling those in, in the program and, and you, 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 you have a set of, of they're called uh, rats. Um, those are the logical connections and you work through these rats and tick them away, you know, and I, and I get to tell him, I was like, oh, I've only got 10 rats left. Oh, I've only got five rats left, you know. And the unfortunate uh, thing is, as the rats become less, they right, become exponentially harder to route. One or two. Or <laughs> so each more, one more dead is a yeah. glorious moment. You get those last one or two, and then you got to back up some. It's like, it's like, but you, you know, I've got ten left. Oh, but you had two yesterday. Yeah. Right. But, uh, but, but you, the the process of making sure everything isn't overlapping, that you have the tolerances, you're still looking back at your data sheets for what you can and can't do. You'll have some components that say, you, you know, you can't throw any signal line underneath my package, you know, or I'm going to destroy it. So you, you look for those things and you're saying from a physical level, how is everything going to fit together and, and where, is, where is it electrically connected? Mm -hmm. um, and if you're not a perfectionist and you can trust your computer unlike there, Tim you can there actually are auto routing tools in, in Jetta and you can use the DRC definitions to help you route these traces without having to be a do it yourself yes I, I'll admit there's and the the auto routing ability of Jetta is very reasonable I'll put it that way um, if you're doing something small definitely just click the button you're done yay um, there are times I'm on, I'm going to be honest. I, I don't understand why it routed something over here, and then back and or through the, like eight like vias, six layers. But, <laughs> yeah, six layers. Yeah, you know, but but there are still, and that's some of that's some of it's on us learning the tool, because uh, there are still options within Jita to sit, to tell it. You know, well, it's only this many layers. Well, I want you to use this style routing. You know. Right, the um, auto router is, is very friendly. Um, if you feed yeah. it the right DRC rules and you feed it how many layers you want 
And uh, you can even select just a few of the nets. You don't want to route all the routes, just some of the routes. And yes. it, it will do all this for you. And it also includes a auto placement, so it can move all the footprints around for you to what it thinks would make most sense logically. Yeah. So if you have an LED connected to a resistor, it's going to move the LED and the resistor to close together off yeah. in a direction. Um, so now you've, you've built a board. And, and you've, you've designed it, and you can do all the little finishing work. So yeah, you're right, done. You've got, you have a board. This is an example of the, the output we're talking about when uh, you can do a simulated uh, print of the board. So it's kind of pretty. Yep. But, uh, but that's not really real. So. No, there's a lot more to do <laughs> after <Right>. this point <laughs> to go to an actual product, to something you've done. Um, and that's sourcing components. So even if you've already gone through the process when you started to pick out, you know, oh, I'm going to use, you know, a 555 timer and I'm going to use a 4017 counter, we well, still well, okay, where can I actually buy 100 of those right now? You yeah, know, today. <laughs> today. <laughs> where, where can I buy those? And what's the cheapest price I can get? And, you know, so, so, yeah, so if here's you want a, 100 of them. <laughs> sometimes you have to look a little bit. Right. Um, but there are, there are these great places, Mouser, DigiKey, Element 14, there's, there's a lot of little electronics design, sh uh, electronics component shops out there um, on the internet. And they're all very yeah. good about when you search them, you can see how much parts are going to cost and what quantities and what quantities they break in price. So for right. example, on, on this project we bought, uh, we needed 8,000 10K resistors, uh, but it was actually half the price to buy 10,000 of them instead. <laughs> And so right. we have 2010K resistors Woo. lying around. Yeah. Um, another good place to, uh, uh, there's a, a search engine called Octopart, um, and it's really cool because it searches DigiKey, Mouser, and others, and it will comparison price uh, them. But usually, the one kind of downside of it is it doesn't really comparison price in quantities. So, right. but if you're looking for a one-off, it's, it's very nice to just see where is this one the cheapest. And also, um, it'll tell you if it's in stock. Just as an aside to Octopart as well, it's not a bad place to look for uh, the, the data sheets for, for a product. Uh, you know, if you know already uh, the, if you know already which chip it is you have sitting there, you can kind of type it in. It's, it's a search engine designed for the electronics world. So. Mm -hmm. And eBay, there yeah, are crazy Chinese people out there who yeah. want to sell you LEDs <laughs> that they found off the back of a truck <laughs> in millions of quantities. <laughs> um, so uh, then finding a board house, um, there are some great options out there. To, to the, the board house is what's printing your PCB for you, um, assuming that you aren't going to etch one for yourself. Yeah, but don't etch. Boards <laughs> are so cheap. They're, they're cheap and getting cheaper, yeah. Um, um, there are some that we have used and some of our friends have used. Uh, in particular, uh, we've had really good luck with Seed in the past. Um, yep. We've ordered several different boards from them, um, and they come fairly quickly. I think the slowest turnaround we had with Seed was uh, about a month, and the fastest was probably uh, two weeks. Uh, they do kind of batch processing, and so does Dorkbot. Um, but recently we found uh, this one guy... Uh, there's a, he has a website uh, called hackvana.org, uh, I want to say, or .net, but he actually doesn't have really anything up there. I met him on uh, the Freenode. Uh, he was like, yeah, I live in China, and I can make you PCBs. And I was like, really? I like the sound of that. Yeah. <laughs> and he gave me a good quote, and uh, we got a lot of PCBs from him. And the turnaround time was one week. Uh, they were yeah. fairly cheap. Uh, he has some kind of sketchy problems in that uh, he doesn't have DRC rules. He says the, the, the board DR house The DRC is the, the tolerances between your, what, how l small a line you can build, how small a trace, how and far how apart, far they, can apart be. they can be, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, design rule check. Um, but uh, yeah, he was like, they make cell phones, so really, really tiny. <laughs> Don't worry about it. And uh, yeah. if it fails, we'll give it to you for free. Don't worry about it. <laughs> So did, we, did we mention that he met him on IRC? Yeah, he was, he was just in pound PCB. He was like, hey, I hear you're making boards. And I was like, yeah. But I would uh, strongly recommend any of y'all uh, find him. Give him some yeah, business. We, we He's awesome. We got business from him. It works. And then finally, so one of the, yeah, the one last, of the last step steps. is you got to chain him to a table. <laughs> and then, you know, Panda Express, give him some food. Make him feel at home. Doing hard labor. And so, yeah, this is... Uh, us sorting 
tons of PNP and NPN resi- uh, transistors right now. Yeah. And it's really boring. Uh, <laughs> Watch a movie, kind of sit back, package. <laughs> and then uh, this is the final assembly, yeah. doing all Getting the boards unwrapped. and packages. And uh, the, you can see one of our recent projects here, um, and they're they're wrapped like meat. That yeah. that was the the idea. So we had to shrink wrap that, but we didn't have machines to do this. We we're just starting out. So and, it's like and we didn't know the 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 proper way to do it until right yeah. after we finished. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> A friend of ours uh, used to work in a super uh, a meat market, and he was like, "Oh yeah, it's real easy. You just need you know a hot coat anger and this other thing, and it's it's easy, yeah. and it takes like we, ten seconds to do one." And we were like, "Oh." Meanwhile, I'd spent days with a heat gun. And, it yeah. was it was very upsetting. <laughs> and so then, what's next? Yeah. <laughs> Collect Something, some underpants, <laughs> and then profit. So yeah, the you've, big thing is you've that you've created your project. It solves your task. It it's a benefit to the world. In, in this it's, case, uh, it's you yeah. This the, so what so the we've been was? we didn't actually touch on this. Uh, this particular project uh, came out of an idea of wanting to teach soldering, and to say you know I I want a kit to teach soldering. I want them to actually have produced something when it's finished and done more than three connections. You know, so so there's something substantial you sit down with, and something you can that does something when you're done, and that's sort of a tank of a design. It's you don't have to worry about what goes into it. And I'd seen a couple projects like the electronic dice. It's a, it's a fun little engineering problem when you're starting out. So I'd gotten advice from other people about how to build these. Kind of tweaked it to what I wanted it to do and how I wanted it to behave, um, and and that's how this design came about. Um, and, and and then the other going? nice side of it is that um, that that my goal out of it was to provide a very good example of of all the output of all these tools. And so right. we've we've also published all of the um, it's it's open hardware or free hardware as I would call it um, all the schematics, Gerber's uh, footprints, the PCB layout, the make file we use to to go through and automate this whole process. Every little bit of it is, is, is out there. And I'll, and I'll admit, before starting uh, some of these projects that we've been working on, uh, not just this one, I had used Eagle before, and Eagle was really easy as for a hobbyist. That was great. And he's like, you know, no, let, let's use something open, open source. Freedom. That's awesome. <laughs> Freedom. And and I, it, I'm not gonna lie, it was it was hard to learn some of the stuff going into Jita. But now that I know it all, for, for I don't want to say I know it all. Now that I know how to use Jita um, to to finish a product, I'm so much happier with what I get done. You know, in that same kind of anal, you did everything yourself way. You know, I'm not worried about footprint generators and stuff like that. I'm going to build the footprint myself. I'm going to finish this myself. You know, um, uh, and it gives you those tools and it gives you that that really. Would you say it's like a romantic a, akin to like learning Vim or Emacs and yeah, yeah, it's exactly. very high like overhead at source. first, but right. then once you get into it, it's it's so faster powerful. and much yeah. much quicker to get what you want done. Yeah, definitely. Um, so so that's we we got a finished product out of it, and and it's we hope perfect. to do more. So. Yes. <laughs> um, and so uh, this is pretty much what we have, um, and we were wondering if anybody had questions, comments. Anything they wanted to know um, more about these different tools? Um, the the talk is available online at, at that web address. Uh, you can download the PDF. For some reason, right now it's 100 megabytes. I don't know. I'm gonna make it smaller at some point. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions about the tool chains or uh, why Free we did what we did way. or etc. Hi. Uh, great talk. I went through something similar just recently. And one of the things I haven't been able to figure out is what impact pin type has when you're using JITA. It's got to have some kind of downstream flow to PCB, but I don't understand what that is. I mark all of my pins as passive right now. Right. You can, you can define your pin types and your trace types, or, or really in, 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 when in the scheme part, uh, the schematic part, you can define um, different traces so that when you are in PCB, it can be marked as it needs to be a fatter trace or a thinner trace. Uh, for most projects that hobbyists would do, like, like us, uh, we're working at very small megahertz, very small power. The standard level thickness of trace is going to be fine for anything you're going to do, and you don't really need to differentiate it. So like on, on this board, for example, every trace we did as the 
just ginormously just fat. fat. Yeah. Um, one of our, our kind of other goals with, with this board was that the board is designed so that it could be chemically etched easily. Yeah. Uh, we had a person. It's one layer. That, it's just, right. It's yeah, all one layer. So. Yeah. We never did any staples It's it's or uh, needed any spots where another layer would be needed. And so that's nifty. But yeah, that's that's the, the purpose of the pen types is you can define, you can make it so that on the next step on PCB, you make sure you don't make a mistake by... Uh, I don't know, routing like a radio signal through way too thin of a trace or, or something I think like that. Instead of power type yeah. Thing. Yeah. I think it's a great example where um, where PCB and G well, GITA as a whole, as a tool chain, works really well, surprisingly well from an enterprise mindset. And so yeah, as a hobbyist, you don't really think about it that much. You're not worried about those tolerances, but the tools are available to you. Well, and so. even if you are, you're, you're, you're aware of your whole project. But if you right. were handing this off to somebody else, he might right. not realize that that part is doing this function and needs to have this tolerance to work. And so it's, it's a way of, of just more documentation in your project right. um, at the source file level. You say that pin is a power pin. They, they know they need something thicker for a trace going to it for yeah, yeah providing power. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I'm curious, how much are you paying for like a two by three double-sided uh, board with a silk screen and solder mask? Two by three, so this board was how big? It was, it was oh gosh, uh, it's three by, th no, 3.5 by like 3.5. So yeah, yeah. This, this, this board was 3.5 by 3.5. We ordered 100 of them and had rush shipping and uh, it was I think $169 uh, and 40 of that was the shipping. And so yeah, it's and we wanted it. It's very cheap. So. But um, the other nice thing about the uh, Hack Vanna guy is, is he is a cell phone, or the person in his board house does mostly cell phones. And so they do two, four, and eight layer boards, I think. Yeah. And so uh, it's, he doesn't care. It's, so if he, you need a multi layer board, he can have it. It's it. not any yeah. big deal to him, yeah, to add more layers. Um, okay. Uh, I'm a total uh, key kind of person because I tr just you know, mm -hmm. transferred to that. And uh, I, I see no reason, like I can't see any reason why you know, you guys choose Gita over KiCad because it's really easy to use. Uh, I use Altium and, you know, like DXP before when I was in right. university. Mm -hmm. And after that, I heard about Eagle because I'm from China. So obviously, uh, people in China don't use Eagle at all. Right. Uh, so I, I heard about Eagle and... Uh, what do you guys use in China mostly? Uh, I, I said uh, Altium. Or oh, just mostly Altium. Altium. Okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, but the very previous is called Pertel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, well, so I want really want to know because I don't use Gita before. I I saw the GUI and I give up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that's a common uh, term. I mean, common well, thing I've heard. Yeah, but uh, be aware that I was uh, electrical engineering major, so I totally mm -hmm. you know used uh, way more complicated stuff like mm -hmm. uh, I think it's called PAD, PDS, P P A D S, PADS mm -hmm. or whatever. So a uh, canvas, yeah. So anyway. Uh, I want to really know the difference between Gita and KiCad and why you guys choose, you know, Gita. Gita. I, I'm aware uh, Gita can do simulation, but that's the functionality most people don't use, right? No, exactly. We don't even use it. Right, yeah. we don't use it because we don't usually do analog uh, that is that temperamental that we would want to make sure that it would work before we'd actually produce. Right, right. Um, I would say the biggest difference between Gita and KiCad is that uh, I think Gita is, is built much more uh, as several different projects whereas KiCad, everything's tied together. So like, um, I have a schematic file for a part, um, or a symbol file for the part, and then there's a schematic file that eats the symbol files, and then those are just tangentially linked to the footprint files. And so it's easy to change each one of these parts individually without affecting the others. Whereas most of the stuff that I see in KiCad, everything is kind of lumped together. And I'm not necessarily saying one is better than the other, but I just prefer to have each thing be its small, own little, bit of the world because, for example, I know nothing about routing. Uh, I get very frustrated in that I finish all of I need to do and Tim has the last step in the process and then I just finish yeah. <laughs> route. But the nice thing is I don't feel I need to know any of that because it's easy enough for us to segment this work um, in that way. But there's nothing in KiCad, to my knowledge, that you, you can't do in Jita or vice versa. Uh, except for maybe some of the simulation and like Verilog, some of the more it, features that aren't part of the core s feature set. Yeah, some, some of our decision to use Jita over KiCad uh, was mostly personal. Yeah, it, we're, we're not here to say that KiCad's actually a bad program, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I still 
so so I want to clarify that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I've been using KiCad for, for a while, mm -hmm. and it's actually, uh, you can totally separate all the... No, I, I'm aware people can work different, I mean, um, apart from each other. It just seems to me that the majority of people that are using KiCad uh, use it in the same way that I see people use Eagle, and that they, they have like they they have a problem in their uh, in their PCB. They click on a footprint and then they edit the schematic and then that changes something in their other uh, in their uh, design. Whereas when we have it hit a problem like that, I have to I go into the schematic and I make the changes and then I uh, say update and I get a basically a diff that I can send to Tim and then diff can apply it. He can apply the diff onto the PCB in its own subsection away, and then he can integrate those changes back in. And I, I just feel like that's a better, for uh, integrity of the project, is a better way to work. And I think that workflow is more defined in, in Jita than in uh, KiCad. But I only really used KiCad for a brief period before I decided that I liked Jita better. OK, thanks. No I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on um, the difference between uh, Jetta or Jita mm -hmm. um, compared to some of the kind of industry standard or the higher level stuff, you know, where the shortcomings might be with respect to high speed designs or six, you know, RF designs, stuff like that. Something that mm -hmm. I, you know, if I wanted to kind of mm -hmm. grow with this software into kind of more complicated designs, right. where might I hit a wall? So first off, I guess I should have said this at the very beginning of the talk, but uh, Tim and I are not EEs or even yeah. CPEs okay. or even college graduates. <laughs> Uh, so, you're gonna have to take this with a tiny grain of salt, what I'm about yeah. to say. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, PCB does not have tools uh, for auto-routing traces based on megahertz delay and whatnot, so uh, it would be difficult to do something like that in, a, um, in JITA. Uh, but in saying that, I have seen some people who are using JITA doing complicated things like that. Um, I'm not yeah. actually aware how they're doing the math to figure that out. I'm right. sure they're not just eyeballing it and be like, yeah, that's looks good. Yeah. Math's not too bad, I mean. There's tools to keep bus traces the same length. They're, right, no, okay. I know there's tools to keep bus traces the same length, but when you're trying to route a signal uh, to have it arrive at the same time yeah. based on different megahertz clocks, and you have yeah. to you have to wind the, the signal around winding, yeah. because yeah. you're uh, you're accounting for the speed of the electron through the path. To my knowledge, PCB doesn't have something for that, but I have. It seen doesn't have anything to make it easy, right? To do but it automatically, like some of the pro tools those do. routes. Sure. Yeah, sure. And then you haven't run into any like uh, multi-layer designs. Have you done any like four-layer designs with Jita or we, know anyone I've, that has? I've played I've played with four-layer processes. I haven't produced anything yet sure. on a four-layer. Um, I think. And I've seen the auto route. The auto route will make those decisions sometimes when you let it. And I've seen it just produce this eight-layer monstrosity because it could. Well, and, and Jita yeah. doesn't have a layer limit. You can tell right. it to keep making more layers. You could Would theoretically you like to use a sixty-four layer process. Sure. <laughs> One thousand layers. <laughs> Board's gonna be that thick. Yeah. It's gonna be great. It'll be tiny though. It'll be like that. Move around. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. But uh, yeah, that's that's not um, a limitation there I've, at least. More recently, I've I've had uh, friends and family who do work um, in, P, in in uh, board houses in in engineering jobs for real um, that I do try to now say like, hey, look at this neat toy I'm playing with. How does it compare? And and I will get some comments that it's either condescending or you know, yes, that is a neat toy that you're working with, but but they haven't come up with anything that I couldn't do in that that they do in their bigger their programs. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. The only other big thing I would say is that some of the other tools now are starting to have these like footprint on demand services, mm -hmm. and uh, there's nothing like that in Jita. There are uh, stores where people have put up their footprints, like like ours. Like we have all of our footprints online. Anybody <coughs> could take them and use them if they wanted. Yeah. But yeah. I'm with you with the anal. Right. Nobody wants to right, use anybody right. else's like, footprint. Because you know there are so many instances where yeah, it's a two, it's a TQFP. Yeah. But, you know, the pad length is actually a little bit wider. Right, right. right. Well, you want a little bit wider because you have the space for it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, I've, I've seen some people route silk over pads as well. It's like, what are you doing? Ah, anyway. <laughs> do, you, do you guys have any experience with places that will actually mount the components for you and what that costs? Is, Ooh. I mean, um, that's like actually... Doing like, like really small, you know, mm -hmm. BGA type of that, thing. That was the step about stuff. chaining me to a dance. Yeah, that's... <laughs> you call me, I'll fit him. <laughs> So you would actually do things like that by hand? I mean, if it's yes. you, you can um, for a certain pitch with BGAs, uh, their people are hot plating them. Yep. But uh, 
more realistically, uh, there are services that will do that level of manufacture or assembly for you. Have you guys um, done any of that? N we haven't had anything where we had them assembled because I have Tim. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, one that's a new service Seed actually just started offering. Um, yeah. They will do assembly for you and they can give you a quote uh, based on how many components and how difficult it is. And uh, they have even gone as far as they'll even sell it for you. They will just they'll never ship you a product you can ship drop ship directly from them they just you just give them everything and trust that the seed guys are awesome because they are yeah. but cool all right thanks no problem hi uh, hi i think you started with the schematic have you ever have you thought of you know going to let's say a higher level of abstraction like verilog or vhdl uh, and if if so uh, why don't you switch to that? I mean, going to, I think mm -hmm. you, what you are doing is that you know you are uh, coming up with a schematic, and then you you decide what are the discrete components, and then you uh, build a PCB, and then you sort of those components, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I'm just trying to understand where if you go to a higher level of abstraction like Verilog, how how we do the whole flow, you know, using G, using JIDA. So with JIDA, there's a uh, there is a path for for doing using Verilog as your your symbol language. Uh, I haven't personally used it because all the projects yeah. we've worked on are um, so simplistic that I wouldn't even begin to think of, of, of using Verilog to define the relationships. Uh, Microcontroller, but, done. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah uh, exactly. Um, uh, I know those tools. I, I agree with him. I know those tools are available. I've seen them in the chain, and I've I played with them one afternoon, and, and I don't know what I needed them for. Right. But, I, and at least personally, I find yeah. for the level of complexity we've we've kind of done, um, most of our projects are 8-bit microcontroller based. Uh, it's just easier to see where everything's going on on a, on a cleanly made schematic uh, than to read through what is source code and, yeah. and Verilog. So I apologize. We, we haven't actually experienced so that. If you're yeah. talking about the microcontroller, then you have the Arduino kit, right? So you can use that. You know, why, why going through all this pain? You know? Oh. Why well, would we bother making this an analog instead of just putting down this one, one Arduino? Yeah, that 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 conversation came up building this kit. Um, I felt this is all this is all passive components because I, I didn't a I didn't like I knew we were packaging this ourselves. I didn't want to go through the process of programming every microcontroller we sent out and making sure it would work. And then when you ship it and make sure that when they solder it together, it's going to work. It's the analog components were just so much easier, and I, f I feel that this is going to be a tank, you know. There's little you could do to break it, really. And um, although I disagree with Tim at first, <laughs> this is a dollar and 54 cents cheaper because it uses <laughs> this instead of an Arduino. Yeah. <laughs> or, I mean, not an um, Arduino, but any app mega. But, but you're right. There's, we talk about building microcontroller projects. Um, why not just use an Arduino? We're, we're not just talking about uh, a, f a fun little robot on your desk or, or a blinky LED, Arduino's great. You can do prototyping with an Arduino. Um, we're trying to get stuff that's smaller, stuff that does other things, more, more purposeful products that, that do a, a thing. And it's great that they're a microcontroller. We hope to open that up to you because it's open source. But but we're not looking to build the next Arduino. The, right. the Arduino is a great product. Just right. We that. probably use the Arduino in the majority of our prototyping to begin yeah. with because it's such a nice little tool. What are some of the projects that you have done, you know, like applications that you can you know, uh, share with us? So we don't like to talk about unreleased products. <laughs> <laughs> but since you asked so nicely, uh, we've been working uh, off and on for about two years now on a uh, implementation of a uh, two-factor authentication token. Uh, kind of like the RSA. Like the tokens, RSA tokens. The key file, yeah. Um, but we've had some issues with uh, battery life. That's one of the problems where we have where we're not. We're not double E's. We're not double E's. <laughs> It'd be nice if we were, because then this wouldn't have taken two years. It'd probably take two months. Yeah. Uh, we've worked on uh, an alarm clock that messes with you intentionally. So you set the alarm for 7.30, and then around 7.20, the clock starts to elicit odd behavior, uh, several different ones. Like, for example, it can pretend it's daylight savings time, and you know, you messed up. Display the or, time in hex. Or, or time drifts by 13 minutes yeah. or several other things. Uh, that's kind of a funny one. Uh, if, and if you're wondering why, is, is I know at least myself and a couple of us, it's easy to trust your alarm clock and go, oh, I got five more minutes. And this, 
this was this we saw as a solution to saying it's like well you can't trust this clock you don't know what's going on right you yeah. got to get up <laughs> uh, and we've also we built a uh, a reflow oven controller uh yeah. so that tim doesn't have to solder everything by hand right uh we've been working on that for a while but don't ha quite have a finished design yet um but fun stuff yeah. where can we buy your kit Meat you want to buy it <laughs> give me some money Lots of it. <laughs> you don't even want to uh, meetstand.com? Yeah, meetstand.com is our website. Uh, and if you go to the website, uh, all the source is under this fossil repo. And uh, mm -hmm. it's licensed under GPL v3. Uh, all of our hardware so far has been licensed that way because I'm a free tard. But. RSA on uh, discrete components like that. No, no, no. Our RSA no. token is actually built RSA off an, an AppMega 328. Of a microcontroller project. Sorry? It's a separate project that we, we've done. It uses an AppMega 328 as the brain and uh, uh, just a 32 kilohertz clock to provide the clock okay. and uh, an OLED screen for the, the display. Yeah. And uh, uh, given the complexity of the RSA that I know, uh, what is the speed, you know? That you uh, it's get? actually pretty instantaneous. Um, we use, there's, I, I didn't realize it when I started working on the project, but there's a, an RFC, I wish I could remember the number off the top of my head, uh, that defines a way of using a SHA-1, um, so you have a secure, you have a secret on your token, and then you take the, you take the time and that secret, and you SHA-1 summit, and then you run an FNV hash to get a very small, uh, like a 20-bit like yeah. uh, number, and then yeah. you display it as a six-digit number to the user, and then you're doing the same thing on the server, and you just, compare those two numbers. And there are crypto libraries for the, the AppMega system for doing this. And it on the 8 megahertz one, it's instantaneous. Yeah. I never even took the time to measure it. Um, and then you just go back to sleep. OK, then it's not RSA. You know, it's no, 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 it's not, no, it's not it's, RSA it's specifically. Of, it's, but it implements it the same feature set. We use it as an example of set. what the product is. And it's the same yeah. uh, system. Or Google is using the yeah. SHA-1 system in, in their uh, two-factor authentication system. Uh, I would say it's of equal security, given that in both, in all of these systems, the only thing that really is protecting you is your secret uh, on, the, on the token and in the, in the server. And the algorithm, I, I don't think SHA-1 has been, uh, or not some SHA-1, but SHA-256 has been uh, broken in such a way that it would make it any less secure than an RSA token. Right. Right. Right, the secure ID yeah. token. But they don't, to my knowledge, they don't publish how they actually implement the uh, their their random. No, but it yeah, it just right. gets leaked. <laughs> right, they lose millions of tokens somehow. Yeah, we, we we heard that it got leaked, and we went yippee, and then we heard that Google was doing something like it. And we went oh. Right, the, one of the advantages <laughs> of our our system, and and the same thing Google is actually doing is is we want you to be able to keep your secret on both ends. And right. we don't want to hear from you. We want to give right. you a device and you keep your secret secret. And if you lost it, that's Tough. your deal. <laughs> Buy <Yeah>. another one. <laughs> Buy another one, yeah. Um, going back to G-Scheme, mm -hmm. um, is there any utility in there to do a bill of materials automatically? Uh, so you, you can do it in G-Scheme, but the, what I find the better place to do it is in PCB. PCB right. has a, uh, two nifty tools actually. Uh, it can produce a bomb uh, mm -hmm. and of all the, you know, the, all the parts you need. And then it also has a, the ability to produce an X and Y plot, so a pick and place machine could place all the, the parts. That's really yeah. handy because somebody gave our hackerspace a pick and place machine. There you go. <laughs> you could just <laughs> assemble your boards yourself or assemble our boards. Uh, uh, <laughs> we're looking for a project to use it there for. There you go. So. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think that's. Sorry, Calgary hackerspace. Yeah, I think we're. Cool. That's most of our time, but. Any other questions? Last yeah. question. You're going to buy one, Matt, right now? Okay. <laughs> Give me Thank some you money. very much. <laughs> cool. Thank you guys so much. It was a great talk. Bye.